my wife Lorene and I were first married, we decided early on that our Christmas tradition would include a real Christmas tree. None of this artificial stuff for us. We were going to have a real tree the old-fashioned way. We wanted the scent of pine needles to be in our home and all of that. How many of you have a real tree right now? Okay, we, we, we wanted to be like you. That's what we did for probably the first six or seven years of our married life. And then one year came, and we made our traditional trip down to a local, I think it was a Boy Scout lot, where we picked out just the right tree that would fit in our house and um, managed to put it in the hatchback of our little car, drag it back home, drag it inside the house, you know, pine needles flying everywhere, set it up, and it was just perfect, the perfect size tree for the per perfect spot in our house. But then after a few moments, we noticed something wasn't quite perfect. It wasn't the scent of pine needles in the air. It was a, a different scent, and it wasn't good. And we sort of sniffed around, and I realized it was coming from the tree. And I got down close and looked at the bottom of the tree, and somehow I had managed, when we chose our perfect tree, to drag the trunk of it through a pile of, well, something a dog left behind. I had to drag the tree back outside the house, pine needles flying everywhere, get a saw, cut off the lower four inches of that trunk, drag it back inside the house, pine needles flying everywhere, set it up again, and about that time I noticed I had a distinct lack of Christmas cheer at that time. And that was the last time we had a real tree in our house. <laughs> and I think that story repeats itself in all kinds of ways. Uh, not, not that we mess up our Christmas trees, but that uh, we can have rather high expectations and then things happen. Now, don't get me wrong. Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. I love everything about Christmas. But sometimes it can also be a stressful time of the year, maybe just a tad disappointing, even painful. For example, how many college students are back with us today? Anybody back from college? Okay, a few of you. How many of you had exams right before you came home? Okay, that's not fun. That's, that's stressful. One of our sons in college had his hardest semester yet, six classes, six finals, all right in the middle of basketball season. Stressful. How many of you gotten your grades back already? Also stressful. sometimes painful even. And that happens. People are traveling, and the travel can create frustrations. There's traffic, and there's crowds, and there, there's airports, and there's delays. Families are coming together. For many of us, that's a source of, of great anticipation and joy and laughter. But for some, there's anticipated awkwardness or maybe even conflict, and maybe there's even dread. We look out at the world, and there's all kinds of suffering in the world. We see it every day. Places like Syria and Yemen, just these heartbreaking stories. Our nation seems to be in turmoil. Even in our local community, there's been stress just recently. And so it was 2,700 years ago when the prophet Isaiah wrote these words to the people of Israel. He writes, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now these were four names or titles given to the Messiah, that is the promised one, the anointed of God, who will come to deliver his people from their troubles. And we as Christians believe these titles, these names, point to Jesus. That's why we celebrate Christmas in the first place. And over the past few weeks here at church, we've looked in depth at each of those names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and today we're looking at that last title, Prince of Peace. Now, if we look at the language used here, the word prince in Hebrew doesn't just mean son of a king. It means that, but it also carries this strong sense of one who is a commander, one of unusual authority, the authority of a king. And the word peace is the Hebrew word for shalom, which we've all heard before. And it's a word that means not just the absence of conflict, the absence of war, for example, but it means the presence of something, the presence of God himself that brings blessing and joy. So the question we have to ask is, how is Jesus our prince of peace? 
So I want to take us back to the words we heard moments ago, to the great story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, to the story that's repeated over and over again, year after year, century after century. And this time, as I read these familiar words, I want you to listen. Listen for the lack of peacefulness in this story. And I'll try to point it out as we go along. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. Pause there. First thing we see is that this story takes place uh, during a time of political turmoil, political oppression. The Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, had declared a new tax. Everybody enjoys taxes, right? And it required a registration, a census. And Joseph had to take his family by law. He had to take his family to, the, to his ancestral home. This would be like uh, America being taken over by a foreign government And then that foreign government issuing a new tax, which, oh, by the way, requires you to travel to the birthplace of your grandparents to register for that tax. Stressful, not peaceful. Verse 4, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. We are so used to the story, we don't hear the stressfulness of this part of the story. Not just a political situation, but a time of personal stress. So here's a child who's been conceived prior to marriage in a manner that no one could be expected to believe, right? Then there comes a 70 mile or so journey, most likely on foot. And Mary is probably 15, 16 years old. And as the King James Version says, she is great with child. So peaceful is not a word you would use to describe this journey. Verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now here's just one more thing to add to the list. The time comes for Mary to deliver, but there's a no vacancy sign on the hotel. There's no room for them. So she delivers her baby in a kind of stable or cave where animals are kept, and the first crib for this little child is a manger, which is a fancy word for an animal feeding trough. Not unlike having your baby born not in a hospital, but in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven and then putting the baby into a dumpster for his first place to sleep. Not peaceful at all. But the story doesn't end there, as we know. Luke continues in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Again, not peaceful. Terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And there it is. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The child born to Mary, laid in a feeding trough, brings peace. But what kind of peace is this? First, what it's not. This is not political peace. In fact, things got worse for the nation of Israel for some time. Pagan Caesar Augustus, a man who considered himself to be a god, still ruled the world with an iron fist. And there have been plenty of Caesars to take his place throughout the centuries. Isn't that right? And they're still in the world today. This is not a kind of world peace. Within months, a murderous king named Herod tried to kill this baby boy and in the process slaughtered dozens of innocent children. Things got worse. It doesn't even mean a personal or a peace that's that's sort of the absence of hardship and trouble. Joseph himself would have to take his little family and flee his refugees to Egypt 
because of fear of what King Herod was trying to do, which is kill their baby. So it's not that kind of peace at all. The peace the angels announce here is a different kind of peace. Peace with God. You know, so often at this time of the year, we see and hear this phrase, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Right? You see it on the Christmas cards you get. Sometimes you see it on billboards. You might even see it in in the town square. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, as if Christmas is all about just being nice to each other. And, of course, that's a good thing. It's just not the point. Here's what the angels say. On earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, this tells us that peace comes from God himself and is a gift of his favor, a gift of his grace. And here's the point. Jesus did not come primarily to bring peace on earth. He didn't. He didn't come primarily to make us nicer to each other. Those are just byproducts of what he really came to do, which was give us peace with God. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is peace with God? First, peace with God means peace with your past. Peace with your past. In Charles Dickens' classic tale, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is confronted with his past, with his selfishness, with his greed, with his cruelty to Bob Cratchit and others. And then he repents, and he gets a second chance. Peace with God means peace with your past because your sins are forgiven. And our sins are forgiven because the Prince of Peace has the authority to forgive. That's the good news of the gospel. So peace with God is being forgiven. Secondly, peace with God means peace in your present, right now. Because the Prince of Peace is also called Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Again, the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, what are you facing today that brings anxiety to your heart and mind? What is it that you face that brings fear? Do you feel alone? The Prince of Peace means that he is with you. Peace with God means the Prince of Peace is with you. Thirdly, peace with God means peace about your future. Now we say, well, wait a second. Uh, The government's in turmoil. Stock market's all over the place. Who could possibly have peace about the future? We don't know what it is. Because your eternal destiny can be secure. That's why. The New Testament says that in Christ we receive a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Our hope is not anchored in politics. Our hope is not anchored in economics. Our hope is not anchored in excellent health. Our hope is anchored in a promise, the promise of an eternal destiny that is secure, secured by the Prince of Peace. So peace with God is peace about the future. And finally, peace with God means peace with others. Peace with each other. It's interesting that our favorite TV shows and movies at this time of the year are almost all about this kind of peace. Uh, Scrooge makes peace with Bob Cratchit and others. Um, The man he once abused forgives him, and they make peace. Even the Grinch is convicted of his Grinchly ways and makes peace with the Who's down in Whoville because they forgive him. Paul in Ephesians 2 says, For he, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one that has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, telling us that the byproduct of peace with God is peace with each other. Because when we have received the gift of his grace, his favor, 
which includes forgiveness, we then and only then can truly offer to others the same gift, the grace of forgiveness, and we have peace. Peace with God means peace with each other. Now let's go back to that title just for a second, Prince of Peace. That title means that peace properly understood as the presence and joy and blessing of God himself, that it belongs to the prince, prince of peace. The peace belongs to him. It's his. And since it belongs to him, then the only way we can receive and experience that peace is if he gives it to us. And the only way we receive it from him is to submit ourselves, to surrender to his authority, because he is the one with all authority. So how does that happen? How do we receive that? How do we experience that? We ask for it. We ask for it. When one of our sons was uh, very young, maybe four years old or so, he went through a phase of being very fearful about going places in the house where no one, when no one was there, particularly going upstairs at bedtime if no one was up there and it was dark. We'd say, time to go to bed. He'd, he'd run over to the base of the stairs that head upstairs and he'd maybe take one step He'd look up into the darkness, and he'd look back at me, and he'd say, I'm scary, Daddy. I'm scary. And I'd say, it's okay. It's just our house. Just go up, run upstairs, turn on the light. You'll be fine. He'd take one more step up. I'm scary. You come with me. I'd get up from whatever I was doing, walk over, take his hand. We'd walk up the stairs, turn on the light, and he was fine. Some time went by. And then all I would need to do is go over and walk up maybe halfway up the stairs. And he could go the rest of the way. Some time went by, and I have to go over and just stand with him and go maybe one step up. Then he could do the rest of the way. Then the time came where he would get to the stairs, look back at me, and I just nodded him. He'd run up the stairs and do it. All of us have seen that in our own children. Something about the promise of my presence was enough to give my son peace. Upstairs was still scary. It was still dark. No one was up there. But with that promise of presence, he could do it. He had peace. And that's what I think our Prince of Peace promises. In John chapter 16, one of the last things Jesus says to his disciples before going to the cross and ascending into heaven is this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Peace with your past, peace in your present, peace about your future, and peace with others. Prince of Peace. One of our traditions is to close this service by singing Silent Night together. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And after the prayer, the music will start. We'll begin to sing Silent Night but you also were given a candle when you came in, a little electric candle like this. There's a little button on the bottom of it. And after I light the Christ candle, I'm going to come down and we are going to pass the light by just flipping on the bottom. Touch, touch the person's light next to you, flip on the, the light, and we'll pass light all the way through until we finish singing Silent Night, Holy Night. So would you stand now as I pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we remember and celebrate today, the great story of your coming into this world to be with us. That you, the one called Prince of Peace, with all authority, came to us. Not just to give us a nice holiday, but to offer your favor, your grace, your salvation, by which we know the presence and power of your peace. In your name that we pray.